unconventional in that we are uh, discussing great classics. And many of those classics uh, that I selected as my top choices are from uh, the 19th century, with a few from the 20th century. Great, and so I'm, we're having 11 classic pieces of literature by Don Massey, teacher 41 years and college professor. So he's going to give us his top 11 best classics that he recommends for readers. The first of which he listed is Therese Rakeen. Can you tell us about that? Yes, I put that in as a kind of a tough type of uh, selection, uh, Dark Horse, uh, by uh, Emile Zola a great um, thinker in France in the uh, mid-19th century uh, who was the French society, which was very conservative. And Zola wrote uh, Theresa Racine, which shows the damage done to people by uh, poor environment uh, and by other things that happen, uh, the lack of, uh, of, of a middle class, um, so Teresa goes through a lot of problems, and uh, somehow she gets through it, but uh, those around her uh, do not. So uh, yeah, like I read a, this months ago, but yeah. Sounds like a desperate struggle for survival. Yes, it is. Yeah, by uh, the great Zola. The more famous book he's written is called Nana, but I won't get into that. Okay, well, thank you. That's a great start, and I don't think that's a book a lot of people have heard of, so let's move on to one that that you will like as well, and that's The Idiot. Who writes that? Can you tell, tell us about that? Yeah, Fyodor Dostoevsky wrote The Idiot, and uh, uh, it's one of my favorite books. Prince Myskin, Natasha, whom he loves, uh, her Love. I cannot recall his name right now, so I don't want to mispronounce it. But um, it's quite an interesting um, triangle of love and death. So uh, the Russians tend to intensify the emotions, and uh, a little more perhaps than the British or the Americans. And therefore, um, uh, the idiot is one of my favorites, one of my favorite female characters, uh, which. Uh, you know, deals with uh, Natasha Filipnova's uh, struggles and very sad life. Wow. And uh, there's an yes. amazing ending to that story as well, which I won't give away, but is there anything you wanted to say about that? Well, yes. The ending is perhaps anticipated, but you don't know exactly when that's going to fall, you know. So... Uh, uh, there's a wedding involved there, and things go awry. So it's just in, a, in this society, the upper class society, when things go awry, uh, sometimes you can't replay it. And Prince Meiskin uh, is a fabulous character. He's a little bit autistic, so the uh, reader should know that. You know, he's uh, a, a guy who's uh, made his mark. In the Russian society, but has been dragged down by poor choices for love. Wow, that does sound interesting. When you say that, it makes me want to pick that one right up. Yeah, it's a, it's a well-known work and is still very popular among the uh, elite readers. Great. So that was right around 1870 Russia. Yes, yes. Yeah, Maybe a little before. And there's another parallel time period with that in America going on at the same time with Mark Twain's famous Huckleberry Finn. And I noticed you have that as your number three. Can you tell us why that's on your list? Yes, that's not necessarily ranked one through three. Okay. It's just the top 10 or 11. Okay. Um, Huckleberry Finn captures the uh, essence of the southern uh, uh, dialect along the Mississippi River in about 1860. And uh, that is a uh, fascinating study of the picturesque life. And uh, Twain's able to put a comedic uh, sense to it. Yeah. So uh, it's a great story. Also, I want to comment that it uh, shows the uh, horrible effects of slavery 
but diluted by the humor of Tom Sawyer, which is very controversial. Huckleberry Finn was a character who maybe wasn't as smart as Tom Sawyer, but he had uh, a sense of moral righteousness. Yeah, and Tom Sawyer was just a typical kid, like a, like my uh, grandson, uh, Liam. Okay. Well, that's really neat that you can see your modern day grandkids in these boys, and I think that's why a lot of America considers them along with you as some of the best of all time. So I couldn't share that even more with you. I love that book so much. The next book you have listed is still often, I think, on the high school list of best reads, and that's Emily Bronte's Wuthering Heights. Tell us a little about that. Well, that's one of my favorite books. I taught that book, that novel, for about 12 years captures the uh, country life of the uh, upper middle class in uh, England, and that includes characters like the uh, Lintons, who, uh, who are challenged by a waifish type of guy from India named Heathcliff, who uh, plots revenge against the Linton family, is able to partially steal Linton's wife, Catherine, who was his uh, step sister or foster sister and it's very passionate um it's somewhat controlled uh due to the mores of the day so it's not like it was written 2000 and uh, you know 15. right it's set in 1850 england or so and a lot of gothic imagery it sounds like yes it does have that and it has religious uh, symbolism references to the bible by the servant Joseph, who is portrayed very well. Um, yeah, so there's a series of characters involved in sort of a revenge story. Now, why are the Brontes so famous? Why did the Brontes make your list? Well, one thing they were able to do is create a character that I really identified with, with the uh, females that I uh, pursued when I was young. Uh, Catherine uh, Earnshaw, who became Catherine Linton, who was really a Catholic Heathcliff, yeah. was one of uh, these confused types of females that I often uh, uh, put on a pedestal, oddly enough, because they had a great range of emotion and uh, they were very intelligent. So my own wife was a little similar uh, to uh, Catherine Earnshaw. That's neat that a lot of people can relate to those writings so well even today and that's why you think that they're up there with the top greatest books of all time. Oh yes, it's a magnificent book and the uh, again I won't give the ending, I'm hoping some of them will read that, but it was one of my favorites. One that didn't make the list, which is by her sister, Charlotte Bronte, uh, was Jane Eyre. I wondered, okay. And, but that's in my uh, secondary list. Okay, well that's really good to know that that made After 11 still top 20. Now the next one you have on here is Return of the Native by Thomas Hardy. Tell us about that. Yeah, that is again, that's a tragic story set in the Heath country of England, a pastoral novel, uh, but it shows the great emotions of the uh, upper middle class in, uh, in that country and uh, great characters, uh, great passion, by Wildy, Michael Wildy, and uh, his love, who uh, stays by, and everything comes undone for them. And there are more wholesome characters in it, like Flynn Yeobright and Thomason. Uh, it's all put in a setting that's uh, beautifully rendered in uh, England. Small villages, yeah, very small quaint Yeah, small villages, uh, the Rettleman, and all kinds of different things and habits that they had. The, the die was very important, and one of the characters is called a rattleman who goes around the countryside and sells dyes for whatever reason. Uh, so I found that to be uh, a disturbing. It's a dark, dark film, but a dark story, but uh, quite, quite well done. Now, is it made into film as well? Yes, it is, and most of these that are made into film. Uh, are not anywhere on the level of the actual writing, you know, so many of these classics don't come out real well or they're tampered with. Right, that's yeah. what I noticed as so well. So one has to really read through it, enjoy it, and get the twists, etc., and the uh, ironies. Very true. 
Well, the next on your list is The Sun Also Rises by Ernest Hemingway. Yes, it has one of my favorite characters, Robert Cohen, who's um, a writer. He's not really a Hemingway hero, though. He's uh, kind of um, argumentative and uh, is a pugilist. And he uh, uh, gets in an argument with the uh, Jake Barnes group that are the Hemingway types, you know. They, they don't like to argue much, and if they do, they, they make up. But Cohen is a fascinating character, and uh, he is trying to uh, get a character named Ashley, Lady Brett Ashley, and she's, um, she's a poor choice for him, but he doesn't understand that. That's neat that the reader has a sense for that, whereas you don't see that Robert figures that out for a while. No, he doesn't figure it out for a while. Um, also, it's set in uh, in France and in Spain with the bullfights and all, and that falls into the plot. So um, it's got some uh, really fascinating uh, qualities to it. It may not be as good as some of the other Hemingway books, but I selected it because I liked uh, Robert Cohen. So you selected that one based upon one of your favorite all-time characters. Yes, yes. That's important. If somebody was to want another Hemingway book that is even greater, what might you say about them? What might they read? Oh, well, the great ones, of course, The Old Man and the Sea was a, a masterpiece of um, symbolism. And uh, the sharks are really people in society. Uh, so there's a lot of that imagery in uh, The Old Man and the Sea. Um, we go through the transformations of life from, we see him as a young uh, man to uh, mostly uh, an older man that's uh, trying to just survive. But Hemingway does a good job of describing the shark and the sea, etc. Other books worthy of consideration are, of course, um, a farewell to arms, and also um, for whom the bell tolls. Now I read to have and have not, and I thought it it had some great um, nature description in it, but um, its choice of characters were people that basically hung out in bars, they were rich, and lived in Key West, Florida, or the case of that. So I wasn't impressed by the quality of the characters. Robert Cohen was a more sincere type of character that had some, some ideals, and uh, he wouldn't have fit into the have and have not. Was this written before the have and have not? I think it was. Um, yes, yes. Um, so he had a few more ideals as a writer then, too, probably. Yes, he may have. He may have. Um, it's hard to figure out Hemingway, you know. Oh, well, that's true. He's in a world of his own. It's true. Well, the next three you have are some of my favorites, so I'm excited to hear you tell us next about Great Expectations by Charles Dickens. Well, that's a fantastic book. I love the uh, dual ending where uh, Dickens came up with an ending, his friends didn't like it, so he changed the ending. I think to some extent he ruined the end of uh, Great Expectations, but be that as it may, sometimes writers give in to other people. And I'm trying to write books and write a trilogy now. And that is challenging because there's mockery in it. And uh, uh, it's got a little Dickens quality to it, perhaps. Um, now, the characteristic characters in uh, uh, Great Expectations is famous. Miss Havisham. Um, Kip, Mrs. Joe Gargery, Joe Gargery, uh, just a whole list of fascinating uh, yeah, British characters. I love that And Joe I Gargery. believe Uriah Heap is in that. Um, is he? Do you recall that? I, I don't remember. Yeah, I don't remember either. that either, but uh, um, there were a couple villains in it. And then um, a book that I did not put on my list, uh, but deserves, or may have been in my supplementary list, was uh, 
David Copperfield. That's what I was thinking. If there was another book, you're right, he might be in that book. But I really like to hear you talk a little bit about the love story between Pip and Miss Havisham, who was her granddaughter. Well, yes, yeah, so Estella, and I think you're correct that uh, Uriah Heep is probably uh, a character uh, in uh, David Copperfield, as I recall that. The, the villains in uh, Great Expectations, um, I'm not sure there's a central villain, but, um, but uh, at any rate. As we chat, let's turn it this way. Okay, so Miss Havisham is really what? Miss um, Havisham is really one of the villains, I think, in the book. To some extent, she's a confused woman that had been uh, cheated out of her marriage by a character named Magwitch. And, um, uh, uh, you know, she was um, uh, always dressed in her wedding gown, so it's a classic, uh, classic piece of writing. <laughs> that's awesome. I'm so yeah, glad. Description. Oh, that's great. Hello. I'm John Jodden. Okay, so we have here, the next book is going to be The Scarlet Letter by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Yeah. A brilliant um, piece of American writing. Um, set in Salem, Massachusetts, in the, uh, actually uh, going back to about the 1680s, uh, around the time of the Salem witchcraft trial, and, um, uh, you know, great characters like Hester Prynne, her husband, older husband, Roger Chillingworth, and, uh, and her lover, uh, the minister, Arthur Dimsdale. Um, it's really very symbolic, and we're not supposed to take it really literally, but uh, Hawthorne was a master of style, of early 19th century style, so we can gain some writing by looking at that. That's really neat. Even the names he used are chilling words, sends a shiver down your spine, and scarlet yeah. letter, and Dimsdale. Do you think Dimsdale was named so because he wasn't that bright? No, it's just that his star had gone out and he got involved in the uh, romance with Esther Prynne, and these were all confused symbols fighting it out. They were not really characters, you know, so it's not like the girl that interrupted us here. She wasn't a symbol, you know. Um, she's real, but these were more symbols struggling. I like that. There's a little bit of drama even in our story as we're sharing. That's kind of an interesting twist. We've got a little plot here. <laughs> yeah. so, um, but no, I really like hearing you talk about that because even as I taught that book to my own high school literature class a few years ago, I think that's a reminder for me when I'm teaching as well and when others are learning that there's a lot more symbolism than we all often give credit. So the next book you have on your list is Uncle Tom's Cabin by Harriet Beecher Stowe. Tell us about that. Yeah, there's a tremendous um, uh, scene in it where the runaway slave woman, Eliza, desperate to come to uh, see her husband, who's uh, also run away in the South, um, escapes on an ice floe. And it's a tremendous scene, you know, yeah. as a, the woman struggles to. Uh, to get across the Ohio River to uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, and yeah. freedom. Yeah. So uh, I put it in there because I still think it has relevance to the modern society with all the struggles they go through and the various uh, uh, arguments between the uh, law and order people and the uh, uh, groups that espouse Black Lives Matter. So it is a very interesting way to lead into some of these issues. And uh, there are some famous characters in it also. Uncle, uh, Uncle Tom. Tom, Simon Legree, and Evangeline. some others. Uh, little Evangeline. Yes, Little Eva. And uh, so it, it's worth reading. It's a very hard to read. It. It's extremely emotional. And it's written around 1850, before the Civil War, and created a 
a stir in the South. Right. She was the woman that Abraham Lincoln said when he met her, is this the little woman who started the big war or rumored to have been the woman that was yes, said about Yes, that was a, a, a concept um, that was, uh, some say it's a myth, I don't know, you know, but uh, at any rate, she, hit, she had a big impact, let's put it that way, on northern readers. And in those days, many people read, they didn't have... Uh, different uh, technology we have, so many in the North, and certainly some in the South, read that book and debated it. Very interesting. I like how they were sometimes sneaky with the way that they brought literature pieces into their government ideals and tried to change society. Yeah. She was one of those as well as Mark yeah. Twain. Yeah. So the next one you have listed is In Dubious Battle by... John Steinbeck? Yeah, yeah that's that? a sleeper, you know. Uh, I read it before, I'm reading it again. Um, and it's um, a book that portrays the struggle of, uh, uh, of uh, communists in 1930 uh, California trying to uh, organize their group. And uh, it is not personally my favorite, but. Um, Steinbeck got into a lot of these controversial topics. He's better known for Grapes of Wrath and uh, East of Eden. Um, however, uh, I think this book has a very good description, so I selected it as kind of like a, a surprise pick. Well, that's neat. I like that. I didn't. Have, I never really heard much about that book. I enjoyed East of Eden. And a little bit grapes and wrath, but I'll have to check that one out. Yeah, and of mice and men, many people would have selected that, you know. But uh, that has been done so many times. I thought I'd go with the dubious battle, and I love the title, you know. Mm -hmm. it, That's true. The fight is dubious, and it comes from John Milton's Paradise Lost, when oh, okay. uh, the fallen archangel. Uh, fights against God, so it has, and, and Milton the Puritan selected that term, you know, in, deep, in dubious battle, uh, the clash in heaven, wow. you know, and it, it portrays good versus evil, and I think there is that aspect in, in dubious battle. Wow. Thank you, that's a wonderful clarification. Yes. So the last, number 11, on your top 11 is As I Lay Dying by William Faulkner. Tell us about that. Yes, after my uh, wife died, I was um, corresponding her, and my grandson said, if you read As I Lay Dying, he saw the copy in the house, and I began to read it. Uh, it was the story of a southern woman that was a school teacher in a rough family um, in Appalachia. And she wanted to be buried in her uh, family's cemetery. And it, it's a fascinating account of uh, not only her mind, but her husband's mind as he gets her ready. And they take her body uh, and they uh, transport it in, a, in the pouring rain. And they manage, I think, to get it to the town. So... It is uh, Hemingway, uh, Faulkner's concept of uh, in a struggle for whatever we uh, can in life, you know, whatever we can uh, try to change. So it is uh, a great story. Wonderful. That's a really captivating idea, and I'd like to read that book. Yeah, I think you'd like the book. There's others that you had as possible just that number 12, which we didn't want to get into that because we thought we would really try to capture the top 11. But if you had one or two that you really thought were 12 or 13, what were those that were almost on the top 11? Well, one that is the best of all time, I believe, is the Bible. And, but that's not really, uh, that's in a separate category. I, I'm Good. not a Bible scholar, but that has some of the greatest stories I've ever written. So I would uh, recommend a reading of the Old and the New Testament. Excellent. Yeah. And I have gained from studying Paul's epistles. But again, uh, I want to separate uh, the religious uh, 
writings from the uh, uh, basic uh, other types of classes. Mm -hmm. Well, that's great. Yeah, that's an excellent choice, the very best choice, as you said. And I see that you have Jane Austen as another possible. She's been my favorite female writer. Yeah, so she did make my list partly for that reason. So uh, uh, in Pride and Prejudice, there's uh, uh, a conflict between uh, two characters that love each other, but uh, they're very stubborn in their own personalities and narcissism. And so there's, uh, uh, this is done very well by Austin, who captures the uh, upper middle class uh, life around the time of the 1830s. So she's excellent at that. Yes, she is. And that's why I keep reading her books again and again. And another favorite for most people is To Kill a Mockingbird. And you said you didn't want to put that on your list quite the top 11 because of the controversy around the authorship. Yes, I don't think that has ever been settled and probably never will be. But I think there's an issue there about how much the Truman Capote contribute to the book, and uh, did Harper Lee uh, rely on him for too much, uh, uh, let's say, uh, writing rough drafts and things. I don't know the answer to that, but uh, it's a very fine book, you know, that captures the, somewhat the prejudice of the South. Now, uh, another book came out by Harper Lee, and some people felt that shouldn't even have been presented because it captures, um, uh, it's almost like saying, well, uh, the South had a right to uh, control the destiny of uh, African Americans. So that kind of goes against the original concept of um, to kill a mockingbird. That makes sense. And so that makes sense why there's even more of a discrepancy between potentially those ideas in one author's mind. So that makes sense why you didn't include it. I love the book, but that makes sense. And it sounds like your criterion for selection was description of time, place, character development, reasonable structured plot, universal themes, generally positive effects, well-developed symbolism, good styles, exceptional plot twists, and evocative insights. So it's nice that you had some great criterion for selecting these books and somebody who's looking to develop their education in the literary world would do well to consider these 11. And plus I'll give a listing on the descriptions of this broadcast of his last 10 that were not on the top 11. So it's gonna be a total of 21 recommended books by literary scholar John Massey. Do you have any final thoughts or? Well, yes, of course. Um there are great books that I did not put on the top 10 or 11. Uh, Ulysses by James Joyce is certainly one. Uh, an another one is the great masterpiece by the Russians, Leo Tolstoy's War and Peace, which has fantastic descriptions of the upper class Russian life before the Russian Revolution. So certainly those are books that many people that get lists together would put at the very top. And one could go on and discuss B.H. Lawrence and other writers that certainly have affected me. And uh, there's just a whole list of great writers, Stephen Crane, uh, etc. So there are many um, fantastic writings, even going back to the early um, Robinson Crusoe and Tom Jones. And uh, the Vicar of Wakefield, which my wife liked, which is a smaller piece of writing about a minister's family. So there are a lot of choices out there. And the first, you have to do some reading. You have to get something going. And you can't just sit back and say, well, I don't know what to choose. That's why people get lists together. So uh, you can look at the lists and then take what you want from one uh, critic and then what you want from another critic and then, but you have to do your reading and, and you can waste your time in reading trashy books. So you have to be careful there. A lot of books are uh, on a uh, poor level and they're even used in high school teaching. And if you get involved in teaching those kinds of books, uh, there aren't, uh, 
many positive rewards on that. One book that uh, people laugh at, but a good one is uh, Silas Marner by George Eliot. Just to throw that in. Yeah. That's great. Well, I like that you brought up getting people to just start wherever they would like to out of the list. It's up to them. As long as they do some quality reading, the more and more they read, they will be better and better equipped to handle these larger works that will bring great rewards. So, wonderful. Thank you so much. I look forward to another time with you. Yes, well, thank you very much for inviting me into this Starbucks uh, coffee uh, establishment and listening to their uh, uh, musical renditions while we uh, while we are here okay. and uh, it is a good place to do some writing perhaps not uh, uh, quite to the degree of uh, it's it really hasn't been used as a uh, extraordinary coffee house uh, very often it should be but uh, they like to keep things at a, at a uh, subdued level Right, so we shook it up a little bit, but we're having fun, and we'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you.